At this time, let's begin today's business call to action webinar, Ingredients and Results of Inclusive Business, Findings from the Business Innovation Facility Pilot. I would like to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Caroline Ashley, Results Director, Business Innovation Facility. Caroline, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jessica, and welcome to everybody. It's great to be at this point where we're sharing findings from the Business Innovation Facility and sharing them with all of you. Business Innovation Facility was launched in early 2010. It's a DFID-funded program, and its mandate was to work with companies to support them on inclusive business and to learn about inclusive business journeys and to share the findings with other practitioners. So that's why we are doing what we're doing today, and we'll explain a little more in a second about who Business Innovation Facility, or BIF for short, has been working with and the questions that we're addressing. Before we go further, I want to thank our supporting partners who've helped us put this webinar together today and reach out to oh, 140 people or something already registered at short notice. We have the Business Call to Action, a global membership flat platform which encourages private sector companies to develop innovative business models, pretty much a similar objective to Business Innovation Facility. And Business Fight Poverty, the world's largest online platform for professionals harnessing business for development impact. Again, a very shared objective with Business Innovation Facility. And of course, our own online practitioner hub on inclusive business, where BIF collaborates with Innovations Against Poverty to share knowledge with practitioners of inclusive business. So you can see why these organizations are all collaborating together, because we're all trying to do pretty much the same thing in some slightly different ways. So it's fantastic to be working together today to share our results with you. I'm now going to ask my colleagues who are here in the room with me to introduce themselves so you know who we all are. We've been working together since the very beginning of 2010. Soji, why don't you go first? Okay, thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm Soji Apampa, Country Manager, Business Innovation Facility, Nigeria. Caroline. Thanks. I'm Caroline Trum. I'm the Monitoring and Evaluation Manager for the Business Innovation Facility, and I have worked mainly based from London. And I'm Caroline Ashley, and I'm the Results Director for the Business Innovation Facility. So, we have been working, some say in the weeds of inclusive business. Our old manager would say under the hood in her American accent, in the engine. Uh, Ellen, I think you're there. We, I hope you noticed that note to you. Um, we have been working in the details, in the nitty-gritty of inclusive business with hundreds of companies. And many of our findings and knowledge about uh, what's happening in inclusive business, how it works, how the distribution channels work, what products work, how NGOs engage with farmers, a lot of the details are already on the practitioner hub, in insiders, in checklists, in all kinds of things. Today, we're raising the game a little bit. We're raising um, the level at which we're drawing together findings and looking at these three big questions, which I think are very relevant to lots of other programs and initiatives. What does inclusive business look like in practice? What have we seen in our portfolio? First question is what results can it deliver, the commercial results and the social results? Secondly, what have we learned about the key ingredients? I'd like to say key ingredients for success, but to be honest, we like to also look at some key elements of failure or challenge, to put it nicely. And the third question we address is, what is the role of the donor-funded technical support? What value does it add? So we're structuring our webinar today around those three topics. After each of those, we will pause briefly for some, some questions that you might want to pose in the chat, and then we'll have more time for a longer discussion and questions at the end. So please, any time while we're speaking, feel free to put your questions into the chat panel and we will, at different points during the webinar, come back to address them. So, first, we just need to explain what the Business Innovation Facility was trying to do. Its mandate was to support inclusive business, by which we mean core business, not CSR, core business that can deliver a commercial return, but also explicitly engages people at the base of the pyramid. Base of the pyramid, low-income people, people who are marginalized from markets. It could engage them as consumers of goods and services, or as producers supplying inputs or labor to the supply chain, or as entrepreneurs and distributors. Our mandate was to support inclusive business in two ways. Firstly, by giving technical support directly to, to companies on pretty much a one-to-one -one basis. And secondly, to learn and share knowledge on inclusive business. So those were our two instruments. 
the technical advisory support and the exchange of knowledge. And we have a long um, logic chain of logic, which is, again is in one of our recent publications for those that like to assess chains of logic. But at this point, I just want to underpin, uh, mention our two assumptions that underpinned our logic. One was that supporting inclusive business is of value to donors. Businesses can deliver social benefits at the base of the pyramid that help reduce poverty. And the other what, was that there was value to businesses. The technical support can help businesses achieve their inclusive business journeys and their commercial objectives. So we'll come back at the end to how we think those assumptions have been validated. Moving on to our actual portfolio, what are we drawing lessons from? So the Business Innovation Facility works in five countries and only five countries for the technical support. We are, work, are drawing today mainly on what we have called our long projects, where a company that was developing inclusive business received between three and 24 months of technical advisory support. The cost to BIF was around £50,000, $80,000, not enormous, and generally matched by the company. We also had 68 short projects where we worked with three to 400 companies, sometimes one-to-one, -one, sometimes in clusters, which were often earlier stage. But we're drawing today really on the portfolio of 40 companies that were in the what we call long project. Those 40 companies were selected by the, uh, the input was selected by an independent selection committee, where the main criteria are that the business idea had a solid commercial proposition. It did not have to have reached viability yet, but it had a solid commercial proposition. It had high potential to achieve social impact at the base of the pyramid, and it was innovative. It was trying to do something new, at least in the market in which it was operating. And the other implicit criteria was we were learning. So we went on purpose for diversity. The sectoral diversity of the portfolio is wide. Agriculture and energy are the largest, but we straddle many sectors. And most importantly, the size of the lead company varies enormously from startups to multinationals. On this, we're quite different from some other programs that really work with multinationals or really work with social enterprises. We have the full range. And in fact, the larger single group is um, large and medium domestic companies, which perhaps is a little unusual. All these details of our portfolio are available in much more detail in our recent portfolio review, which is online. But one last and very important point. We took a risk, and we took a risk on purpose. If we had only sought projects, if we'd only funded, sorry, not funded, supported businesses that clearly were going to make it, there would have been no point giving technical support. If we'd only supported businesses that were fine, riding high, we wouldn't really have learned very much about inclusive business. So we knew at the beginning that we were supporting a range of businesses that had clear potential to, live, to deliver commercial, and commercial results and impact at the BOP, but weren't sure if they were going to make it. And we never knew at the beginning how many would thrive and how many would stumble. Well, actually, what we found is the answer to that question varies all the time. Every time we take a snapshot of how the portfolio is faring, we find things are moving around. And the ones that were progressing well last year have just currently hit a problem and have stalled, and the ones that were stalled last year are now proceeding really well. So the picture keeps changing, but the picture you have on your screen now is our assessment as of late 2013, where we've divided the portfolio up into those that are flourishing, progressing, stalled, really on ice. So you can see that 19 out of the 40, so nearly half, are either progressing well or flourishing. But they're doing well. We have a good chunk in the middle, progressing slowly. We're not too sure how many of those will make it and how many won't. And we currently have 10% that are stalled or on ice, maybe to resume, maybe not, who knows. We, in, we always expected that kind of breakdown across those elements. That's what it is now. Who knows quite what the, uh, the spread of the portfolio will be in years to come. We have made a big effort, however, to track the results, both the commercial and the results at the base of the pyramid. So I'm now going to hand over to Carolyn, who, as she said, was our manager of the monitoring and evaluation system, to report on the results we have seen so far. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, and as Caroline said, I will now give you at least a short and quick insight into some of the results, but all the detail is also published for those of you who are interested to see more than what you will hear now. Now, 
in order to understand what type and levels of both commercial and social results inclusive business can deliver, before doing that, it is important to understand at what level of maturity those businesses actually are. Caroline has just shown us how we are assessing progress at the moment. And what you can see on the slide now is our current assessment of project maturity as of late 2013. At the beginning of application to BIF, over half of all the businesses had already been developing their inclusive business model or venture for three to four, some of them even more years. Now, at the end of the pilot, as you can see from here, the vast majority, so 66%, are in that middle section, either at early operation and validation stage or moving into early implementation. This um, picture of project maturity is also reflected when we look at the commercial results. The commercial results are emerging, but they are certainly early stage. Five businesses in our portfolio have reached profit so far, which is one of the several reasons why in our commercial analysis we are focusing a lot on turnover figures to understand trend lines and trajectories going forward. And um, as you can see from this graph here, the expected growth in turnover is impressive. However, let me note here that those figures in the graph illustrate average turnovers and variability between the companies is actually enormous. Just over half of the businesses expect two, around $2 million of turnover, whereas the largest five are anticipating turnovers of something between $13 million and $85 million. If we move to the next slide, um, the actual turnover data, data that we have is somewhat limited, but the data that we have available from about half of the business in, is, businesses in our portfolio shows us that although actual growth is lower than previously anticipated, we can see a steady growth of 62% between the year of the BIF baseline and one year thereafter. Still looking at commercial results or trajectories, we can also see that businesses are indeed pursuing strong commercial drivers. And there, there are two interesting messages I want to show with you here. Firstly, and you can see that reflected in that table on the, on the slide, this is the specific drivers that companies identify as their top priorities seem to differ slightly between models that focus on low-income consumers, so either selling products or services to people at the, uh, at the BOP, and models that, that focus on benefiting low-income produ producers. However, both models have clear strategic drivers that have to do with markets and profitability. The second interesting fact is that despite their overall early stages, about 50% of the businesses in our portfolio are actually already feeling initial evidence for those long-term commercial goals being realized. Moving on to the development or social results, we can see again a somewhat similar picture to the commercial results. The numbers of um, people reached at the BOP are moderate so far, potentially high in the future, and certainly vi variable. Overall, the inclusive businesses in our portfolio are reaching under 100,000 households at the BOP in their first year of engagement with BIF which is what you can see here on the graph in the top left corner, but do, however, expect much greater increases in the future. Again, the numbers vary enormously between models that focus on consumers and, and uh, models that focus on producers. Models that focus on consumers could reach hundreds of thousands or even millions of households while, while producer-focused models um, aim for maybe reaching, 
my aim for maybe reaching a few thousands of farmers in a few years. Um, the 20 companies for which we have estimates available for year five after start of BIF support predict that they might reach close to six million households at the BOP. Now, acknowledging that, that those company estimates might, might sometimes be over-optimistic, so what you've seen in the, in the turnover figures, and also acknowledging that things might not always go according to initial plans, we have um, calculated a what we call revised for realism estimate for the number of households at the BOP that the portfolio might reach. And you can um, see that calculation on the slide here as well. So we estimate that across all the 32 companies that are currently making progress, uh, roughly 3.6 million households could be reached by year five after this support. So still a, a quite an impressive number of people that will be hopefully impacted in the future. Of course, development impacts are not just about the numbers, but about the actual people that are behind those numbers and the question how people's lives are actually impacted. Um, and just to give you some examples of how that's already happening, you can see here on that slide, in the top left corner, you can see Kwama Matwahan in India who is using his mobile phone to make an MCRISHI query. Before using MCRISHI, which is um, a technology platform to provide mobile advice to farmers, Madhvaham used to spray pesticides in, on his okra six times, as was recommended by the local shopkeeper. Based on advice from MCRISHI, he now switched to a different uh, composition of pesticides, which cost him about 50% less and is only needed four times. As a result, he experienced a 15% increase in his okra yield. In the middle there, you can see people living in Lower Bondo village in Malawi. Thanks to MEGA, which is Malawi's first privately run micro-hydro micro power scheme, the whole village is now electrified, which means amongst many other things, of course, that women do not need to bring their own candles to the hospital anymore to give birth. In the top right corner, we can see Ida in Zambia. Ida's reading and math scores have increased by 80 and 280% respectively after using iSchool, which is a Zambian startup company offering e-learning materials for all grades in Zambian primary schools. Now, as I mentioned before, this was only a short introduction in, in, the, in the really comprehensive picture that we have available of, of the results already achieved and potentially to be achieved in the future. Before handing over to some questions in the audience, I would like to hand the word to Soji to just give us his view on what inclusive business actually means for people living in Nigeria. Thanks, Caroline. <clears throat> it's, it's not too different from the examples you've given from India, Malawi, and, and Zambia. Um, for instance, in northern Nigeria, extreme northwest of, of Nigeria, where um, young girls are involved in selling milk, um, there is a company who have created their, their dairy business around helping these young girls to go to school by paying a premium on the milk that, um, that they buy from their, their parents, bought from their parents, but in exchange for the girls going to school. And in exchange for this increased income, there's also uh, an attempt to improve the livelihood of the girls um, uh, in, in the process. There's also a company that, it, it, instead of continuing the gas flaring in, in Nigeria, is providing affordable cook stoves to lots of um, low-income families in Nigeria, in a place where gas, cooking with gas, was seen as a preserve of, of the rich 
people in society. And, and the improvements in health uh, and so on um, was only for, for the richer people in society. Um, that is also being changed. But it's not just all social. Those companies are after a profit, and they're trying to build a business model that will enable them to reach the bottom of the pyramid and at the same time build a business with revenues increasing and profits increasing. Finally, um, pharma cooperatives as well. In, in, several, um, in several areas in Nigeria, um, in, in improving their yields, improving their incomes, uh, in exchange for guaranteeing supply to um, producers, people who, who need their, their produce. So making that linkage, making sure there's an alignment of incentives, that's part of what this business model has been doing for, for, for people in Nigeria. Thank you very much, Saji. So that, that's off. a few answers on the first question about the commercial and social results that inclusive business can deliver. Let me just quickly deal with one of the questions that has come into the, uh, the chat on the consumer and the producer side, the difference between the two and some examples. Because Soji just mentioned the girls and the, um, the business where people are supplying milk. We count that as a business that is sourcing from BOP producers. Milk is one. We have a cattle fattening uh, project in uh, business in Bangladesh, another one that's fish rearing also in Bangladesh. Tomatoes in Bangladesh, cassava in Bangladesh. We also have cassava in Malawi, oil seeds in Zambia. So whether it's crop, fish, cattle, whatever, these are businesses we count as producer-focused. And um, where people at the base of the pyramid basically benefit from earning income. And as you saw in Carolyn's slides, the uh, project tends to be – sorry, the um, – turnover and the, base, the number of people at the base of the pyramid reached through these producer-focused projects seem to be much lower than a single consumer-focused business, but nevertheless, obviously very significant for the people who are earning new income. The consumer businesses, we've already heard about several. Um, Carolyn mentioned um, Ida, what's her name? The student Ida, who's benefiting from iSchool, which is learning resources. Soji mentioned the stoves. We heard about Nkrishi, which is aiming at farmers but with access to information, so that's information service, and Mega for energy. These we all count as consumer-focused businesses. We've had another question coming in about how we have calculated the revised realism figure. We have just published our full portfolio review, which if you're really into the detail and want to go through um, the 75 different slides and graphs that separate year one, year five, estimates, optimism, producer, consumer, you know, if you're into the details, like we spend a lot of our lives, we have put that in the public domain, which we're glad about. Very briefly, we took the estimates from all the businesses that could supply estimates for year four and five, which is about half the portfolio, we scaled everything down by 30% because everyone's always over-optimistic about how quickly they can achieve their results. We actually have, I think, one or two businesses that exceeded their estimates, but everyone else was slower to reach their goals. Then we took our analysis of how the business was faring, flourishing, progressing quickly, slowly, and everything, and we scaled the estimates down according to the status of business development. And then we added it all up again, and that's how we came up with a revised realism. So it takes off a bit of optimism. And it also assumes a mixture of success across the portfolio with a high share of the flourishing ones succeeding and a lower share of those that are progressing slowly uh, and um, none of the ones that are, are cancelled. But, but anyway, more detail is in the portfolio review online to go into that. Do people have other questions on the commercial and social results that inclusive business can deliver in our portfolio? Please. Oh, and please could you type them into the – if you type them in the chat and send it to all attendees, I think actually we panelists aren't seeing them. So if you type them in the chat, please make sure you're sending them to the panelists or just put them in the Q&A section, which is fine. Let's see. Sorry, we're just checking for your – questions and making sure we're actually seeing anything that's coming in. And we have another question about how different is inclusive business from social business. 
Uh, I think we mentioned that we have some social enterprises in the portfolio, some startups which are quite mission-driven. They intend to make a profit, but their core business is doing something that is like iSchool, developing online educational resources, like Mega, um, developing micro hydropower for remote communities. Um, those ones you could certainly call a social business, like Jita in Bangladesh, which actually transitioned from being an NGO program to a business. But then we have other ones that are very clearly established companies that have been operating in this space for years, whether doing uh, toilets or biscuit manufacture or beer brewing, whatever, and are now developing an inclusive business, which is just part of their business, which sure has a social mission, but I don't think they would call themselves social businesses. So at that point, I think we will move on to the second part of the webinar to try and explain what we have witnessed about the key ingredients of inclusive business models. And this comes back again to the separation between the consumer-focused and the producer-focused models, because of course they're different. The first point we have witnessed actually cuts across them all, and it's to do with the length of the journey. Carolyn mentioned that many of the businesses had be already been developing their inclusive business model for three, four, five years when they received support from BIF. Nevertheless, they're still five years away from really operating at the scale they want to see. So we estimate that it's a 10-year journey from inception to scale, and that most of them are around year four, maybe three, maybe five in that journey. Looking more specifically at the consumer-focused model, although they're incredibly diverse in terms of their size and their country and their product, we looked across them all and actually found some quite similar challenges and some similar ingredients in what they were trying to do. We think of the business model as like a jigsaw, where you need to get all the different pieces in place and you need to get them fitting together. And of course, the challenge is to make them all fit together at the same time, particularly when you're working in the, the base of the pyramid market, because so many pieces of the jigsaw don't already exist. It's not like a business can just slot in with a new product and use existing shops, an existing banking system, an existing market analysis. So looking at the consumer-focused models, of course they have to get the right product, but it's amazing how much the products that the companies are working on have actually evolved as their understanding of the market has evolved. Again, we've mentioned the iSchool example, and there is a deep dive case study on iSchool and their provision of e-learning resources. Their product has evolved enormously as they have developed, and they now have um, tablets, which are very robust. When we first met iSchool, they were talking about more traditional laptops where everything needed to be done in a much more traditional way. One of the biggest challenges we've seen on the Consumer Focus Project is the distribution channel, because these companies generally can't afford to set up their, whole, their own new distribution channel into base of period markets, but existing channels don't serve well enough. So the main solution there, which has also been written up in one of our Inside Inclusive Business Reports, tends to be partnerships. We have seen companies, large and small, partner with other organizations that already can reach into the base of the pyramid somehow. Microfinance institutions are certainly one typical kind of partner who already has the reach, but they're far from the only one. And thirdly, we could just highlight the issue of market creation, because the whole problem, the whole challenge, the reason inclusive business is perhaps different to, to what we might call conventional business is so much of the market doesn't exist. And companies not only need to create demand for their specific product, but often they have to create demand and awareness amongst consumers. They have to create a habit of using a new kind of stove, paying perhaps to use sanitation services, paying perhaps for energy rather than putting up an illegal wiretap, paying for all kinds of things that just haven't been in their markets before. So they've had to try and internalize that challenge into their business model and find ways to to afford ways to create the market or link up with partners, business partners, NGO partners, and government partners to invest in market creation. And that is a big challenge. So those are some of the pieces of the consumer jigsaw. Um, again, you'll find much more detail, and we will be pulling out um, more details on this in our, one of our final reports in January. But let's look now at the producer jigsaw, which at first sight looks much more simple. It's only got four pieces, not six. 
Obviously, you need to small hold all the products, whether that's cassava, tomatoes, or fish. Obviously, you need the production system, seeds, extension advice. But we really want to flag the other two, credit to make the whole system work, because often there's a lack of credit for anyone to invest in the system to achieve the productivity that reaches the market, and the intermediary functions, which where some businesses have really struggled, because companies don't tend to be skilled at engaging with lots of smallholder farmers, but equally, who else is skilled? There are problems with government services, NGOs have certain agendas and certain sets of skills, but it doesn't always work out that well. So we've seen the intermediary functions as a real challenge for the producer-focused business models. Uh, I mentioned we have some deep dive case studies. You can certainly find more details on some of the producer-focused models from Malawi and Bangladesh in there. But at this point, we're going to turn to Nigeria, back to Soji, to tell us more about a couple of the businesses that have been working with farmers there. Thanks, Caroline. Um, it, it's been diverse. The, the, the sorts of um, opportunities we've, we've um, encountered in Nigeria. But I'll present two, which show like two different ends of the spectrum. One is a large bank that decided to go into agriculture um, as a way to uh, strategically grow the bank into a dominant position. Um, you know, the World Bank says that um, uh, 70% or more of Nigerians li live on less than a dollar a day. That gives you about 100 million people. And um, agriculture, which accounts for, for the occupation of most, um, most people um, of a working age in Nigeria, uh, accounts for 42% of the GDP, not oil and gas. It's actually agriculture that's the big thing in Nigeria. So. Finding any bank that manages to find a way of tapping into that market will find a way of getting the growth that they need for the medium to longer term. Um, many banks, of course, um, could potentially be involved in agriculture in Nigeria, but most of them only finance local purchase orders and, not, and, and are not really into agri-banking. So the, the trick has been how to find a smallholder finance scheme that provides um, for a share of the 100 million or so unbanked people. And the way that this bank has gone about it is to look for how to improve the yields, the incomes, and guaranteed offtakes for those who are the smallholder producers in order somehow in that mix to be able to find their own fortune if you like. Contrast that with a startup that we also supported in Nigeria, which um, was interested in, in, in developing spices, spreads, uh, jams, uh, and baby food. Um, so for them, what they wanted to do was to launch themselves into the um, su supply chain of some big supermarkets. And, and to, to gain that credibility, they needed um, um, uh, credible sources of supply. Um, they needed to, to have the quality guaranteed, the quantity also to, to be stable. Uh, so for them, um, they had to link up to um, pharma cooperatives and through that get the, the kind of returns that they're looking for. So um, you, you have two different sizes of business. Uh, but both of them making um, their own returns from being able to engage with the smallholder farmers by squeezing out the middleman, um, but for, for very different reasons. But in terms of the challenges, um, there were big challenges faced by the bank because now in trying to ensure that there are improved yields for, um, for the smallholder farmers, they had to ensure that there were guaranteed off-takers who would buy up the produce that is, um, is being cultivated by the, the smallholder producers. It meant they had to go into all sorts of bits in the value chain that is not their core business. And to do that, they had to partner with organizations at every level of it in order to keep the risks low 
for themselves. This is not, uh, is, is not a, um, a unique or particularly innovative thing that is being done in Nigeria, but uh, if, if you compare it with things that are happening around the world, but for Nigeria, it was very innovative because no one else is daring to take that kind of risk. And that's the important part of what the bank has been doing. Um, for, the, for the startup, the biggest problem they faced was around the research and development that they needed to do to create um, a product around baby food. They were hoping to replace um, some, of the, um, some of the purchases that are made by international agencies like UNICEF. They, they would like to get into that kind of supply chain, uh, but to develop a stable product, they found is probably outside the scope of what a startup is easily able to, 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 to reach out for. So the summary of the, of the challenge we found for the bank was that returns for the bank will only arrive when full scale is, is achieved, which means that lots and lots of farmers are benefiting, lots and lots of farmers are being helped, then the bank will reach the kind of returns it's looking for. But for a startup, it was the other way around, where um, the startup tends to, to get the impact on their revenues from the beginning, and until they scale up what they're doing, the farmers do not quite benefit as much um, because you, you need um, large volumes of purchases to come from the startup in order to be able to impact the, the lives of the farmers. So where are we currently with, with, with these two examples? Um, for the bank, um, improvements in yield and incomes have been reported by the farmers from a base of $272 per year and uh, the, from the cultivation of one to one and a half hectares, uh, about 540 rural farmers uh, currently benefit from this, but it looks set to grow to about 3,500 farmers by 2016. This is still a pilot project for the bank. And so it's a potential game changer for banks in Nigeria if a bank suddenly finds that through helping the farmers, it's able to bank 3,000, 10,000, 20,000 people. I think the other banks are going to sit up and begin to wonder what they can also do in this space. Um, for the, for the um, startup company, um, they have already started supplying the supermarket chain that they targeted from the beginning. Um, they've gone on to raise equity finance. They've also um, bought their own factory space. They've, they've been able to um, uh, improve their production. They've obtained further support from um, the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund, which is interesting because um, the opportunity was initially signposted to uh, BIF by the AECF because they found the opportunity was not as well defined and didn't meet their criteria. But after this startup um, got a hold of the monitoring and evaluation tools and products from BIF and was better able to structure their arguments and their thinking, after a year and a half of support from BIF, they were able to go back and now receive support from the same AECS, who was very happy to support them at that point. So what can we say in in, in conclusion, um, the, 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 the startup company is likely to keep growing um, in the next few years, and they are doing quite well. Um, so, Caroline, from, from what you mentioned earlier, we've, we've worked with a whole range of businesses, from the startup to the multinational big bank, and we've found that um, both types of businesses can make a difference in the lives of people at the base of the pyramid. Thank you, Saji. Uh, it's interesting, we're getting questions in, um, I think particularly on the, the Stanbic Bank example, which are actually very, very hot questions because they're exactly the issues that emerged in the deep dive case study on Stanbic IBTC, which was launched last week. We'll post the link in just a second. 
But so, Saji, we don't probably don't need to go into detail here, but let's let's ask you to address a couple of them. Okay. Because people are asking, how is the bank mitigating the risk? Because most banks struggle with risk, as we know that's something that this model has really focused on. And how are the farmers actually accessing finance, and are they collaborating to form cooperatives? Yes. To, to start with, um, the, the bank is only dealing with cooperatives and lending to cooperatives rather than lending to the individual smallholder farmer. It's very difficult otherwise. Um, but through the cooperatives, the, the farmers actually have um, accounts um, with the bank. But how the bank has mitigated the risk is to look at every single step in the chain and come into arrangements with third parties that can help them manage the risk. I think that's, that's the best way I can describe it at this point. But the, for the full detail of what the bank is happy to share, it's in the deep dive case study. And I think it's best for the person who, who's put up the question to actually look through the case study, which is available online um, to, to, to go through. Thank you. Certainly one of the, the findings in the case study is that it's, it's the model to us which has made the biggest attempt, attempt to close down risks yeah. in this whole um, agricultural system. When we compare it to the other producer-focused and agricultural-focused models, um, which have been really honest with us, and in the deep dives they've talked about how they have struggled, things have gone wrong. There was a, there's a lovely case study from Bangladesh where there was a great pilot, the harvest fails, but the pilot worked in terms of showing lessons of what works and what doesn't and how to improve the business model. But risk was a real issue there. And uh, there's another case study of a cassava business in um, Malawi where, again, risk has come up with a risk of insufficient quantity. So um, Standic is very interesting because of the ways they have closed down risk. People are asking for links to the case study. We are going to get those posted in the answers. Um, Someone has asked about the number of producers that can be reached. Um, Steve Morris, does the panel think there is scope to achieve significant scale to producers, 10 or 20,000 producers, through such inclusive business models? Well, now, Stanbic is an example which is selling banking services rather than actually buying, although, of course, their clients are doing the buying and is one of the um, farmer-focused models with the biggest reach. I'm going to come back to Carolyn because she's been looking at the numbers of people at the BOP reached across the producer model. So just add another comment on that. Well, I think if we if we look at specifically the standing numbers, they are aiming for numbers higher than that. Sure. If we look at the um, more, how can I say, traditional models where a company is sourcing a specific crop from smallholder farmers and maybe they have not sourced that crop before or maybe they have previously not sourced directly from smallholders, which is more the Spice, spices example, example that Soji gave from Nigeria as well, I think the average of, uh, targets that those companies have, even in, in a few years from now, are lower than 10 or, or 20,000 producers. Yeah, but th there's a slight difference here. Um, in, in, the, in the case of a company buying from a cooperative, the, the company is just incorporating them into its own supply chain. So it's without the, the volume of purchases, you don't really impact on, on those uh, poor producers. But in the case of the bank, the poor producers are actually the target of the bank. It's somebody else who's doing the buying. Mm -hmm. They are facilitating efficiencies in the whole value chain and trying to remove the, the, the constraints in the value chain from the business being, um, being um, fruitful. For example, ensuring that there's somebody available to buy up all that the farmers can produce, ensuring that the farmers have um, access to good quality inputs, and, and that the, the input provider is also part of the agreement, ensuring that the farmers are properly uh, coordinated and making sure that they're working in cooperatives. All of those kinds of things is where the bank is now spending its energies and efforts in order to reduce the risk. That's part of how the, the, the bank is doing it. And that's why they can reach a lot. So in theory, if they can find another crop with another big buyer and they can, they can line up everybody in the value chain, 
Then they've got another bunch of a, a couple of thousand included, and they can keep re replicating the model um, as far as possible. So that's why they're able to reach a lot more than, uh, say, a company that's doing the buying. Great. I hope that's got that question answered. It's a single company sourcing its produce is likely to reach the numbers of farmers Clarendon was talking about, but a bank that's reaching out across crops and across different buyers and producers can reach more. And um, the person who asked that might also be interested in the Imkrishi model, which is in India. It's not banking. It's a mobile uh, transaction platform. But it has a similar effect. It's trying to reach out lots of different farmers and lots of different buyers and input providers. So again, it's trying to transform the agricultural value chain without being an agricultural business itself. One of our other very, very interesting examples. Uh, someone just said, so it's an example of systemic change in the market system. Yeah, we have spotted about half a dozen of these inclusive businesses that are trying to really change how the market functions and create a, a gap in the market and uh, unblock inefficiencies in the market from which they will profit, but others will profit, particularly the farmers. And Sandvik is one of them, and the Mkrishi one that I just mentioned is also one of them. So, yes, Steve, we agree with you. Um, Pamela Decker asked about going back to the jigsaws. Perhaps we could just go back to the producer-focused jigsaw, that the distribution channel was an issue in the consumer one, but not in the producer one. Yes, well spotted. The distribution channel is to really reach your product out to the consumers so they can buy it. I guess in this, this, this producer-focused one, the, the converse of that is the intermediary function. What's the channel that reaches directly to the farmers, whether it's with information, extension, or actually doing the aggregation, the offtake, the aggregation, the, the bulking, the transport. So in this model, we haven't called it the distribution channel. We've called it intermediary functions. But there's no doubt that's the problematic one. Now, I think that's most of the questions on this specific example. There's a number of questions which are to do with um, reliance on donors and our generic measurements. We're going to tackle those, come back to those after the next section where we look at the role of donors more. So I'll just check for any more questions about these business models, these jigsaws, these journeys, these ingredients of success and failure. Third parties are insurances. So yes. Basically, um, I think what the person is saying is that the bank has used the third parties to insure themselves against risk, and that is quite correct. Yeah. And um, just a final word on these sort of key ingredients. So as I mentioned, some of our written materials are still forthcoming, and we have also looked at some of the ingredients that cause, let's say, delays or maybe failures. And there's some really interesting lessons there as well. Obviously, when people leave the project, that has emerged as the top one, the champion leaving. But there's a host of other ones about lack of access to finance and um, the, the business model not quite working. So we'll be sharing more on those as well. Right, let's move on to our, oh, sorry, yes, just our final conclusion on these uh, four Ps of the business model that works. You'll now see on the slide We've come up with our own four Ps of inclusive business, not uh, product price and placement and um, uh, whatever it is. But we have come up with a pilot that is needed for testing. And it came out so strongly in the BIF models, you need to test the model and learn and change it. Passion, of course, that's very obvious for the uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Passion goes a long way in those early years. But we really want to highlight perseverance and partnership. Partnership is what a lot of the companies have used to solve the challenges that were beyond their own comfort zone and beyond their existing skills. And perseverance is the key thing, going back to this long 10-year journey. Carolyn mentioned they have very strong commercial drivers, and they are perceiving them. And very few companies really have given up on the inclusive business model that they started on and for which they engaged with support. The rest are going, and sometimes we're actually quite surprised at how, how strongly they're sticking with it. And we see that as because they have strong commercial drivers and they have perseverance and they see a real long-term goal. So they're kind of on the train and saying, come on others, jump on this train. Right. How easy is it to make a case for a pilot project? So you just want to touch on that one before we move on to the next section. I think that is the main reason that uh, BIF 
has been useful to many companies because quite often large companies who can afford to do a pilot, um, it, it, it set, they set up a chicken and egg situation for some of their managers who said, I have to be able to show that I can reach um, certain objectives and show also the, the business model of how I can reach it in order to be able to get the go-ahead to pilot it. But I can't really get the funding to pilot it without getting those numbers together. This is where this has typically supported businesses to do some of this research, to put together the case study working alongside the company to then enable them to take those kind of internal decisions to be able to get the pilot approved. So um, it's one of the ways where technical assistance has been um, very useful for, for, for large companies. It, it provides that safe space outside um, um, you, the revenues of the company itself to be able to identify what needs to be done, which is why some fail, some succeed, but at the end of the day, there is a lot of learning from it. They, they understand what works, what doesn't work, and then it encourages the, the business to be able to invest in what does work because the project has helped them um, minimize the risk to themselves of going this route of inclusive business. And it's really important for the biz, uh, for, for um, BITS to have supported them in that way because what BITS is looking for is the social impact at the end of the day and the sustainability that the alignment between the revenues of the company and the focus on social impacts then uh, produces in, in, in the end. So, yeah, it's, it's a long answer to no, a really good. important question. You're very much yeah. taking us into our, our next section, which is exactly yeah. that. So you're saying that a pilot is very important for the company to learn, and one of the fundamental roles of BIF has been to support that pilot testing learning yeah. process. Because our, our core assumption is that getting the business model right is the right thing, and yeah. that's where we're helping them. So we're now going to look a little bit at the feedback that we've received on whether, how, why the technical support from Business Innovation Facility was useful to the companies as a, a part of the answers to these questions of what, what is the value of donor support. We'll then come back to some of the other questions we've had about um, donor support and reliance on donors. So Dodgy, I'm going to present the feedback that we've had from across the portfolio and then okay. ask you to sort of comment again on that from the Nigeria perspective in addition to what you just said about our, our role in piloting. So we have obviously asked the companies we've been working with for their feedback on how valuable was the input. We just want to emphasize that the input was tiny compared to what they themselves are doing. The companies have invested well over 100 million pounds across the piece into these different businesses, some of them quite small investments, but the largest one I think is around $23 million. Um, variable, but it's, it's their business and it's their journey and it's their investment and our technical support is a small addition to that. So we asked them to, to say which answer would be more appropriately describe their situation. They wouldn't have gone ahead without us. We didn't really want that, so a couple of did say that. Is their inclusive business bigger, better, or faster because of the BIS support? And that actually um, seems to be what half the portfolio are saying. They can tangibly say that the inclusive business is bigger than it would have been, it's better, tends to be better designed, or it's progressing faster. It's not taken so long to go through the mistakes, and it's taken a few shortcuts because of BIS support. We're counting that as high additionality. 40% say it was useful and it was easier with you, but they don't say very specifically bigger, better, faster in a particular way. And we, you can see some of the quotes that we have to, from these kind of companies here. And in about four of the 40, we counted as low additionality. It was useful, but to be honest, we didn't really help the company get past whatever the bottlenecks were that were being faced. But, so that is based mainly on company feedback. Now, we talked before about the revised for realism estimates. If the BIF portfolio reaches 3.7 million households at the base of the pyramid in a few years from now, we as BIF clearly couldn't claim 
we delivered that, you know, our input was pretty small compared to the company. And for some of them, if the additionality was low, we certainly couldn't claim it. So we can't say what would have happened without the BIF support. We think more models would have been a bit shaky and more would have not really progressed, but we, we don't know how many. What we have calculated is of that 3.7 million, given what we know about our additionality, how many can we plausibly link to our technical support to the input? Where, how many might be attributed to some strong impact from BIF? And for that, we come down to around 1.5 million households in year five, we think would be plausibly linked to the value of our support, helping those businesses to reach those households. And we're saying households, multiply by five if you want to know the actual number of people, which is what other people tend to do. So that's our closest we would get to um, putting a number on additionality. But as Sodji said, there's a whole load of issues that you can't just measure in terms of numbers of people. It's about businesses having the confidence to try something different. It's a very long-term process. So we certainly wouldn't try and summarize it as just those 1.5 million. Now, when was it useful and why was it useful? We are not saying that technical support is a panacea. We are not saying it is essential or it's useful for all inclusive businesses, certainly not. If we explore with the companies why it was useful and for whom it was useful, these are some of the issues we've seen. And this again builds on what Soji said. It seems to be most useful when it came at the right time, when a company was trying to do something new and needed a hand, or a specific team inside the company was trying to do something, didn't yet have it proven inside the company. It was valued, many of the comments we had were about the value of an independent perspective. Maybe some of these companies could have paid consultants once they'd got enough board approval and you know, taken a bit longer to get some money. But you pay a consultant, they give you what you want. I think what we've all heard, and particularly Soji has heard, is you gave us an independent perspective and told us where we were going wrong. And the BIF input was able to identify new skills and partners that sometimes the companies didn't even quite know they needed. That's why, that's in, this is what the companies say as to why they found it useful. It's also worth saying that we didn't offer a standardized package. We always meant to develop a menu, but to be honest, it had to be so tailored, and so flexible, and it was so much managed inside each country by the country managers that a standard package just wasn't going to be viable. Now, some examples of what kind of support was provided, that's a very good question, thanks, thanks Loris. The most common kind of support was business models, putting together a business plan, putting together a business model, testing willingness to pay, looking at viability, looking at investment, looking, looking at numbers, ground truthing the actual business model. But we had all kinds of things. We had someone, a couple of people looking at recipes, Someone looking for dried flour recipes, is that right, Sochi? Do you want to tell us more about some of the more extreme uh, yeah, niche the, inputs? The, there's a company that, that was creating from local drinks um, a sachet product. So they needed to be able to freeze dry and create the powder version of some local drinks. Um, so finding the right technical input, that took some doing to be able to help this company in northern Nigeria achieve that with the Zobo drink, which is from the hibiscus plant. Yeah. So that was one niche type of technical support. Carolyn, can you think of a couple of other uh, less standard packages? Well, I think for me, one interesting or very exciting example is in Malawi, where we were supporting, again, a um, startup company who wanted to set up Malawi's first um, fruit processing company for the production of Malawi and banana fruit pulp. And they not only wanted to do that, but they wanted to set up an organic farm so that they could actually um, produce their fruit pulp in an organic matter. So part of the support package that we delivered was around, okay, how do you actually set up an organic banana um, plantation in Malawi? Also, of course, I mean, from the perspective of the um, monitoring and evaluation manager, quite interesting. Also when companies came to us and said, well, okay, I have a business plan now. Um, I'm happy with my numbers and I'm uh, confident that I will have positive development impact on farmers, but I have no idea how, be, how I will be able to measure those. So we were doing a few um, pieces of work around helping companies to develop KPIs, key performance indicators, going beyond the standard uh, business KPIs, moving more into the social area. So how can you really measure farmer um, impacts 
sounds easy, but in practice uh, sometimes quite difficult. Mm. And with some of our um, producer-focused models, there was a lot of emphasis on the smallholder engagement, how exactly to engage with the smallholders, how to work with the NGOs who are involved. There's a lot of focus on that in the different crops. And on the consumer-focused one, there were a lot of um, what you might call market landscape assessments. Some were willingness to pay, some were market landscapes. We haven't prepared um, to go in detail in this session on the challenges that companies talked about, but we have tracked that regularly. And indeed, one of the challenges people identified as, I think it was the top challenge at the start, if I'm not wrong, Carolyn can correct me, was lack of market information. Because, the, yes, Carolyn's nodding. The top challenge identified at baseline was lack of market information. And that's the challenge that's come down the most by the time we did our update with companies in uh, just a few months ago. We asked them again if their top challenges are still their top challenges. And it's one where many companies identified that this support has made a difference to addressing the challenge because they now have more information about the market they're working in. Um, sorry, were you flagging us? Right, okay. So these are some of the reasons that people are seeing the technical support as useful, but very different types of technical support. As, as we're emphasizing, it was tailored to what they were looking for at the time. But uh, you'll see on the bottom slide a couple of warning triangles. You know, clearly, it doesn't solve everything. As we said, there were cases where we might have made a really big difference to the business model, helped the company rethink it. But they're still in our progressing slowly category. A lot, that's true of a lot of our ones that count as medium additionality. Uh, the, the business model changed a lot, but it hasn't taken off yet. And where we did ask companies for suggestions on how it could be improved, the most common theme was too short. Don't just pilot something with us. Help us see that through into implementation. We had quite a few comments on that. So that was our first and our main instrument, the technical support, the intensive technical support with 40 companies. We also had the lighter touch advisory support with a few hundred other companies. Well, we haven't prepared slides on the feedback there, but I have to say it, was, it really surprised us in how positive it was where we sometimes would have workshops with a cluster of companies. And even a year later, people can say what they're doing differently as a result of it and very high percentage found it useful or very useful. So even the much lighter touch support has come across as useful. And then finally, our, our other instrument, our other mandate was, of course, the knowledge exchange, the knowledge sharing. It's extremely hard to know how people are using the knowledge that you've shared with them and what difference it makes for them, especially when it's online and quite impersonal. For, for the workshop, 400 participants, we've got their feedback forms. We know what they've said they're doing differently. But for the 80,000 people who we've reached through the practitioner hub, we don't tend to know what they're doing. A few of them pop up in our inbox, which is wonderful. What do we know? Uh, we know we've now reached 80,000 unique visitors in 190 countries. As we only marketed in about 20, uh, it does suggest that there's a lot of other countries where People are seeing value and spending time online to find it. We do know that visitors from the south are growing faster than visitors from the north. And from some of the emails we get, we know it tends to be people that don't have information overload, which some of us in London or Lagos suffer from, but people are really seeking out information about what other businesses are doing. And that the number of visitors per month uh, is now around 6,000 a month onto the practitioner hub. So. We are seeing an appetite for information on what others are doing and finding. And the information that we share on the Practitioner Hub about the different businesses tends to be one of the most popular parts of the Hub. So given limited information, we have a sense that there is a, a hunger and an appetite out there. Those are some of the findings on additionality. For the more technical people who really want to look at donor additionality, we will be producing a paper with more of our, our evidence and our assumptions to look at um, donor input in uh, January. I know we had a question some time ago, I think it was from Adam, asking about whether businesses risk being dependent on donor input. Uh, I think maybe we've kind of addressed that by saying how small we were, but would one of you like to just add a comment to answer Adam's question on that? Yeah. Uh, the, the first thing is that um, cash was not part of what was offered. Only technical assistance. There was no cash. Um, the second thing was that, again, it was short inputs. 
very specific inputs, and the orientation of the inputs was to help the company get alignment between their needs to improve top-line or bottom-line results and how to get social impact at the end of the day. How do you build that business model? So um, it, it was not long enough to create a dependency, uh, and, and the, the idea was to find ways to help the businesses help themselves to achieve what they wanted to achieve. So, uh, Caroline, I, I, I think it, it, it was very difficult to create a dependency. And also the kinds of amounts we're talking about were minuscule compared to the kinds of um, um, investments that the, the companies were themselves making mm. in, in, many, uh, in many cases, not in all. The sweet spot, when we, when we were sitting around in these rooms nearly four years ago trying to design BIF, we talked a lot about the sweet spot where a company wasn't necessarily going to make it or make it easily or quickly on its own, so technical support would make a difference, but it had enough impetus for us to be confident it was worth investing taxpayers' money into it and we could help it get there. And none of us knew if we'd find a big sweet spot or not, but I think our sense is that actually in all five countries, that sweet spot has emerged, but in different ways. So they're not dependent, as Dodgy says, on our input. But the input has made a difference, and the companies are making real progress. We're getting quite a few questions about what we would recommend more generally for, for donors and what's useful input. We'll come to those in just a second. Uh, I want to come back to a question that was posted a while ago, looking at us as a donor program trying to draw results, someone asked, um, across this diversity, how do we have generic measurements and what kind of generic uh, key performance indicators? Carolyn, why don't you answer that one? Um, sure. And we have, um, let me focus on two points here. And then let me also say that we have a publication that um, explains our whole m and &E system. For, so if there's further appetite, I think it was um, Micah who, who asked that question, then I would um, certainly encourage you to have a look at that. But um, it's a great question, I think, and certainly, yes, I agree. We have a lot of diversity in the portfolio, and the question was, how can we um, compare the turnover of a small um, startup in Zambia with the turnover from a inclusive business venture that is being developed by an established big Indian conglomerate, even if, of course, we are not looking at the company's whole turnover, is, is, is very relevant when we designed our system. So two points, as I said. The first point being um, we developed a small core set of what we called universal indicators that we tried to track across the board. But then we also supplemented those with what we called additional indicators just to allow to um, well, do justice to the diversity in our portfolio. And I mean, it starts with simple things like a consumer focused model that sells gas stoves um, will not be able to track the same uh, development or social impact indicators as a model that tries to source um, cassava from smallholder farmers in, in Malawi. So we had this set of, a core set of KPIs that, that was the same for all, and then we supplemented those with specific additional indicators um, depending on the pro project needs. And then secondly, and that really um, comes back to that, oh, how do we, how do we com uh, compare small companies, large companies, we not only looked at these core measurable indicators like turnover or investment figures or number of people employed, we also um, developed over the course of this what we called our indices, and we developed various indices, but the main ones being a what we called commercial um, viability index and a development index. We really wanted to get a feel for, well, how are our projects doing? What is the likelihood for them to reach commercial viability in three to, to four to, to five years from now? And in that, and again, it's, it's all um, available in the public domain, we looked at a range of different indicators. I think for the commercial viability index, it's six different things that we look at, numbers and more qualitative assessments, how a project is doing. And then we weighed them and uh, did lots of ratings and scorings to come up with a high, medium, low scoring at the end, and, uh, hoping that that would be a bit more 
well, accessible but also comparable to give an indication of, our, of how our portfolio um, is doing. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Yes, you can imagine there's been quite a lot of work going on on that. And as you say, those that like the details, keep your eye on the impact network in the practitioner hub. We've had a few questions coming in about scaling up this um, and what other donors can do. We'll keep those for the last 10 minutes. We'll be finishing in 15 minutes. Just before we get to that, we have an interesting question. I see one from Henning on partnership and cooperation with NGOs. Um, Carolyn, do you want to say a few words on that? I'll add some. And then we also have a question we should probably all answer about our most impactful projects. I don't think we have one, but I think we have a few examples. And we will then look at the questions about scaling up. Yeah, so the question on partnerships, I think it, it already um, came up in that slide that I think it was titled Our Four P's on Inclusive Business, where partnerships was definitely one of the P's or one of the jigsaw pieces. So you can see from there that, yes, we certainly think it's a key ingredient of successful inclusive business models. Is it easy? Certainly not. And um, one comment maybe from my side, Karen, before you, um, um, I hand over to you. I think very often what we have seen is from the very beginning, everybody is sort of aware that, yes, okay, we can't do that on our own, so we want to do it in partnership with others. And also aware that um, we are, especially for companies, that them being aware, well, we are good at a small number of, of, of key things, and, but there are various other stakeholders out there that uh, are better in, in these other things, so we want to work with them. So that traditional um, example, probably the most, most um, familiar for, for many of you maybe is, okay, again, in the agricultural um, space, a big company that wants to source from smallholder farmers, but they don't want to be the ones that provide the extension services and the, the training and, and the whole com direct communication with the farmers. So what's the, what is one of the possible solutions? We are going to work with an NGO to make that work. Now, what we have seen, and again, there's an interesting case study, I think especially the universal one on cassava sourcing in Malawi explains that really nicely, where the company went in with exactly that notion and spoke to, the, to a few NGOs at the beginning of the season and said to them, look, please speak to your farmers. We want to source as much as cassava as we can at the end of the season. Um, at the end of that first season, I had to realize that actually something did not quite work, and somewhere in that link there was a well, communication challenge, so the partnership did not work as previously planned. In the case of Universal, it has led to the, to the um, situation now that Universal wants to do much more, so that in a way they are going out of their core comfort zone. They are still working with NGOs, but they are doing more, and they are structuring that partnership in a slightly different way. That's just one example, um, but for me a very interesting one. Caroline, do you want to add? Yeah, when, um, when DFID sets up a project, you always have a logical framework, a big table that shows all the different inputs, activities, and outputs, and everything. And interestingly, the original logical framework for this actually had a set of outputs around partnership, partnership brokering, partnership facilitation. But when we started, we found if you knock on the door and talk to companies and you say, oh, no, we don't have a checkbook, by the way. There's no checks, no cash here. We're offering you technical support. And then you move on and say, actually, we want to come and help you forge partnerships. You just don't get very far. So it was amended, and we moved away from this very explicit offering of partnerships. Now we've looked back to see what actually did happen with all the technical support that was provided. And we saw in many, many cases, and particularly with the large established companies, what the TA provider ended up doing was brokering partnerships. So uh, we work, were working with the um, partnership initiative from International Business Leadership Forum uh, at the time. And Graham Baxter would often say in those early meetings, you, people don't know what they don't know when it comes to partnerships. People don't always know they need a new partnership, or they need to end a partnership, or they need to invest in partnership management. And I have to say the experience of BIF has, has rather borne that out, that people need to invest in new partners, ending partners, and managing partnership. And the, the partnership initiative, TPI, has got a whole load of resources on their site. Uh, Floris, specifically to answer that question you've just posted, 
on how to broker partnerships. Some of them are already on the practitioner hub as well. So moving on, we have some questions which are to do with going forward. What would we do to scale the program? What do we recommend for other donors? Courtney is asking what we recommend for others and is there anything that is not going forward? Floris is asking what we would suggest that others scale up. Uh, let me mention the one thing that's not going forward and then I'll let Saji talk about what is happening in the bit going forward. BIF2 is going to have a much more focused approach. BIF1 was a pilot, incredibly wide, on purpose, as we said, every kind of sector, lots of lesson learning, a pilot is to learn lessons after all. So it had this big emphasis on knowledge exchange. BIF2 is not doing that, so BIF2 won't be part of the practitioner hub. We're hoping to keep it going with some other donors. We'll announce that in January, I hope. So that, that international knowledge exchange element um, is not going forward. Um, and this too will have a more specific focus on specific sectors in different countries, really trying to catalyze bigger, bigger bang for the buck in fewer areas. Let me hand on to Soji to talk more about how he sees this too happening in Nigeria. Thanks, Caroline. Um, uh, the way this too has been structured is that now more rigorous market studies will be done because um, with examples like Stanbic and so on, um, we're beginning to see the exciting end of inclusive business that it's possible through some of these businesses to um, attempt systemic change uh, and to ch attempt change at the whole market level. So there will be a number of market studies done in country and market strategies developed. Uh, uh, and for the more viable ones, then interventions will also be developed. And this is how it will be taken through, but in partnership with um, some of the companies who are working in those particular markets. Um, so there's a slight change uh, in emphasis for BIF2 which is now to aim at systemic impact and systemic change from the beginning. So um, this too is designed to go for scale from the beginning. Um, and, and that is building on the learnings from, from BIF 1. Um, it's still early days yet, but BIF 2 is also not going to be in all the countries of BIF 1. Um, BIF 2 is not going to be run in India and it's not going to be run in Zambia as well, but it will, be, it will nor Bangladesh, but it will be in Nigeria, it will be in Malawi, and in a new uh, country which has been added, uh, Myanmar. So it's those three countries that are going forward with BIF2. And there may be more. Yeah. Maybe more in 2014. People yeah. are asking yeah. us what we would suggest that other donors should should do, what would be most valuable for donors to do to support inclusive business or specifically to catalyze inclusive business results? I think we should just each give some of our personal reflections on that and then also come back to the question on uh, which projects in the BIS portfolio were most impactful. I don't think there's one answer, but there's a, a couple. So we'll address both of those. But before we get to that, I just want to get to one more um, on who is being reached. Um, someone called Mary has just posted a question that Sodji I know is very close to your heart because it asks about reaching disadvantaged youth. So, and last time I was in Nigeria, we spent a long time talking about the disenfranchised youth and the need to reach them. We haven't in today's talk really talked much about who is being reached. We have analyzed to see what the base of the pyramid is. Uh, to what extent we can say people are living on around or under $2 a day. And although we have limited data, we think many people are under or around $2 a day. Uh, a number of projects are specifically reaching women. On the other hand, a number of projects are more specifically reaching men because they're working with male farmers. So we have looked at that. We will share more on that. But Sodji, can you, why don't you quickly come in on, I know this is a good topic for you, the, the reaching disenfranchised youth or not, and why you think that's important for business to do that. And then we'll wrap up. If you take a country like Nigeria, where 70% of the population is 35 years or younger, <laughs> you, you really don't have um, uh, other markets for the future, other people to reach for your workforce or your suppliers in, 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 the, in the middle to longer term. 
that is really where the business is going to have to, um, to, 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 to learn to do things. But if we also go by um, what has happened in the Arab Spring, where lots of youth are unhappy about uh, the governance of their countries, and they're unhappy about their livelihoods or the lack of it, finding things that can help the young people, um, especially the poor amongst the young people, uh, is very important. For example, there was an idea in Nigeria around newspaper distribution, which would revolve around getting the young people, giving them a voice, a platform for them to raise the issues that they are unhappy about with the government, but also getting, um, making a living from distributing newspapers. Um, that, that's one idea. Another idea was around organic fertilizers. The fact that um, there is a lot of waste, farm waste, and so on, going um, in, in cities um, and, and in the countryside that could be harnessed and put together to feed an organic um, fertilizer plant. And it is possible also for the same young people who gather this material to be trained as extension workers so they can also help the farmers and help them understand how to apply um, the organic fertilizer to get improve their yields and so on. And the reason why something like that didn't go forward was because most people don't understand yet the differences between chemical and organic in terms of productivity from the soil. Um, people intuitively understand how it should work, but there are no numbers available that would say if you applied it this way, you would get this yield as opposed to using the chemical fertilizer and so on. So there are great opportunities with inclusive business to include young people, not just male, but female as well. There, there are many opportunities um, around that. But the biggest thing that I think donors could do, if I can jump to that one as well, is in providing access to finance you know, to have more inclusive financial markets. Uh, that, that's the biggest thing, because at the end of the day, regardless of what idea you come up with, to, whether it's with youth or with women, with young girls, whatever it is, it needs to be funded. And in Africa, well, let me speak for Nigeria, the biggest challenge that most people have is how to access the finance. No matter how good the business model is, the challenge is usually around finance. Thanks, Oji. Uh, Carolyn, why don't you give your sort of wish list, your thoughts on what you would like donors to do in this space, and perhaps also touch on the question of which projects do you think are particularly valuable in terms of impact? Oji, we won't let you escape without that one as well. Uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the question on, okay, what should donors do is, is a very interesting one, and I think it was also one that already came up at um, our final e event that we had um, at the end of last week here in London. Um, and I think Caroline also touched on it when she, when she explained, okay, this is the value that we are seeing um, from providing technical assistance to business. Is, is TA the only thing that donors should do? Certainly not. So I certainly, I very much agree with Soji here that uh, the access to finance issue is, is already one when businesses based on our portfolio when businesses apply to us, and it is in many cases still one at the end of our support, maybe, hopefully, we have contribute, contributed to making them more investable, as many people say, because I think this challenge of people that provide finance saying, well, we are certainly willing to invest, but we can't find enough investable opportunities out there is a valid one, which is, I think, one of the reasons why there's a role for different tools. There's a role for TA, there's a role for finance, there's certainly a role for donors to work in the enabling environment because often we can also see that those are challenges that businesses are facing. Uh, Carolyn, you said I think I could wish for something. So if mm -hmm. I would uh, be on the donor side and I would be allowed to design my own uh, private sector development facility, I think I would love to design a facility that offers finance but with some uh, compulsory technical assistant, uh, assistance attached to it after uh, the 
investment decision is made. So that would be my personal wish list. Okay. Um, okay. May I also say mm -hmm. my personal? Oh yes, project. So my favorite project, but I, I think we probably also have we we all have probably um, different ones. Uh, I mean, for me the. Jita one in Bangladesh is a very, very exciting one, probably also quite unique because it started off as a NGO program uh, funded by Care Bangladesh, the rural sales program, and this helped this program to get commercialized into a social business. And now in under two years, the business is actually already profitable. So for me personally, a very impressive example. Dottie, do you want to mention a project or two? And I'm going to give my little wish list to close. Okay. Um, mine is a cook stove project in Nigeria, which I think is going to really, really um, reach a lot of households um, in Nigeria, plus the Stanbic project as well I, I'm rooting for. And I really like the startup, Ace Foods, which, which – um, uh, has been able to raise equity capital. They've bought their own factories and everything. I, I think that they're a, a business to watch in the short term. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, so we think of India. We talked about these businesses that can transform systems, and, and Krishi is definitely a favorite of mine, although it's got a long way to go, and although it's evolved a lot enormously already. Um, there are some which seem well set for progress. Malawi mangoes in Malawi is just moving ahead. They've opened their factory, they've got their investment, they are doing business differently. Ones like that just really inspire you because before we went and there's a plot of earth and now there's a factory. But there are other ones like Health Store in Zambia which has got a long way to go and yet you think if they can really transform health, health, health services in the way that iSchool is transforming education that's beginning to move from pilot to, to scale, they are just inspirational. And then there were some, like uh, 3S Shramic, we had the entrepreneur here in London last week. They've got such a long way to go to get private business models for fee-paying toilets in the slums, and yet it will be so transformational if and when that is achieved. You can't help but um, believe they will make it eventually. Uh, in conclusion, my wish list in the last 30 seconds, I would like donors to take risk and be upfront about it. I think we've proved in this that you can take a risk and still deliver results with tax taxpayers' money. To have a good long time frame. I think we've also proved that in three to four years, you can't go far enough, and really it needs much more than three to four years. And to share findings, uh, I think people are interested in hearing these findings. We thought transparency and confidentiality would be really big problems for us and that companies would not share. We were amazed what we were allowed to put in our deep dive case studies, and the companies have been much more willing to share because they're market leaders and they're upfront about the problems. So I think, again, that for donors to invest in being transparent with companies about their own successes and failures as donors and in businesses is well worth it. I'm afraid we've run out of time. We are seeing a few last questions popping in. The, um, everything is on the Practitioner Hub. We will do a blog to follow up on this and pick up answers to other questions. People are asking for links. We will definitely put those in the blog onto the Practitioner Hub. And please keep your eye on the Hub. We have a landing page for all our final findings, which is where everything still coming will be, and the impact network, all the details, what ME information is. So with that, we just have to thank very much our partners who helped us put on this event, um, Business Calls of Action and Business Fights Poverty. Very much thank the panelists. Thank you, Soji. Thank you, Carolyn. It's been thank great. You, great four years, great last hour and a half. And thank you very much to everyone for dialing in and joining us today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you again, Caroline, and thank you again for everybody joining us today. I did want to let everybody know this does conclude our session. Um, you are free to disconnect after you have sent us uh, your feedback in the chat. Looks like we do have quite a bit of feedback coming in, and again, we do appreciate that. Once you are uh, done sending that through, you can disconnect by clicking the X in the upper right-hand corner of the WebEx window. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.